Hi, everybody. It's uh, Patrick McCarthy here reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. We're at our Fountainhead Studios in Westwood uh, on the Port Coquitlam side. But uh, if you walk across the street, you can see the Coquitlam side of our great uh, region. And today we have Councillor Craig Hodge, who's here to talk to us about what's happened over the last four years. And Councillor Hodge, welcome to the studio. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I know you, you, uh, you know, for um, most of us who follow politics, you know, you have a, we see you and your comments and your footprint on social media is quite good for, I call the Facebookians, you know, yep. kind of that demographic. For those who don't really know you too well, you're going into your fourth term. Just a bit about yourself and, and who you are. Sure. So I uh, grew up in Coquitlam, uh, was, um, went to uh, Hillcrest Elementary School, Charles Best Junior Secondary School, got interested in photography when I was at uh, Centennial School and uh, went on to, uh, to you know, work in the newspaper industry. Uh, spent 10 years working at a daily called the Columbia Newspaper, which operated in uh, in the uh, Coquitlam, New Westminster, Surrey area. And, uh, and then in 1984, it shut down and I helped start the Tri-City News at that time. And uh, so I've been interested in, in photography, interested in my community, uh, have real interest in history. And so I've uh, been involved in the Heritage Society and I'm a past president of the, uh, the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce as well. And you're also a scout leader. Scout leader, yeah. coach ball hockey, coach soccer. Still, uh, my kids went through the scout program, but I'm still involved in uh, scouting on uh, with the Burke Mountain Group, the Fourth Port Coquitlam. So uh, enjoy uh, enjoy scouting. I was in scouts as a youth, and uh, and um, as I said, my kids all went through the program, and uh, so uh, now I continue on to uh, to help with the group. Oh, that's good. So so. You know, that's 12, you know, basically three terms, you know, 12 years. I don't think most people have thought, hey, it's my third term, give me COVID. So just uh, for folks that sort of as we've gone through that as a city, just sort of the impact it had on the city and, and sort, of, uh, sort of how the city came through it and, and sort of things that people may not know or do know. Yeah, I mean, you know, you think you're prepared for, for just about anything that can happen during a term. And, uh, and, and COVID uh, caught everybody uh, by surprise. Uh, I mean, we had plans in place. We had some, uh, you know, equipment stockpiled. But what we did count on was how quickly it changed the social fabric of our community and, uh, and created a lot of isolation for people. In the early stages of the pandemic, the, the only thing we could do was, was isolate. And so uh, uh, we did a good job, I think, of keeping our city services uh, running. I mean, even though people were able to stay at home or shelter in place, we still had to make sure we were providing uh, essential services, police, fire. Uh, we kept the water running, and that was the, that was the main thing. And uh, then we started to turn our attention to the, the social isolation aspect of it and what programs could we keep up and running. Certainly, we discovered our parks were extremely popular, so we started repositioning some of our staff to into the parks, uh, keep the Coquitlam Crunch open, keep our parks going, keep people uh, recreating. Uh, so that was it. And then we started a program for, uh, for meals as well to deliver meals to seniors uh, because many of our seniors relied on uh, drop-in program and pick up a meal when they were there. So we were able to uh, sort of, again, keep in touch with our seniors and make sure that they were uh, being cared for as well. Yeah, and so, so you, and I think one of the things I found interesting about Coquitlam is that you talk about the ambassador you had or people in the parks. I think, I think people have ambassadors, but you sort of seem to repurpose. Uh, there was quite a few folks that were sort of, I guess, helping people with that transition, which I thought was quite amazing, actually. Yeah, it, it was twofold. One is we wanted to make sure we kept our employees uh, working. Uh, we went through the pandemic without laying off any of our senior staff. There were, you know, our seasonal, seasonal workers obviously weren't required because the pools weren't open, but uh, we, we had many of our senior uh, management program people were redeployed to areas where we were able to provide uh, services to the community. And I, I think that paid uh, paid dividends for uh, for the community. And, and I think our residents were very appreciative of the program that we were able to run during the pandemic. So so some of the candidates are talking about fiscal responsibility. So mm -hmm. and COVID, obviously, there's outside of COVID and the fiscal impacts of COVID. Is there, is there some, some highlights around the fiscal impacts of COVID on, on Coquitlam? No, I think we, we came uh, through it really well. Uh, our, our building numbers are higher than they'd ever been before. The construction industry was deemed as an essential service, so construction continued. I mean, we pivoted. We had uh, people working from home, but uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, the infrastructure that was being built, we were continually able to build it. So so our revenue was, was fine. Uh, we, we didn't have to... Uh, 
uh, to cut programs other than right during the during the pandemic itself. But uh, they, uh, our, our city is in really good shape, and I think that's a testament to the uh, to previous councils and to our our current uh, management in our finance department that uh, we were uh, living. We uh, have enough uh, cushions that built in that we were able to to weather a storm, and, and we didn't know what kind of a storm was coming. You know, we, we talk about preparing for climate emergencies and other things. So we were prepared. We just didn't know what emergency was going to going to hit us. Yeah. So so when you compare Coquitlam, I mean, for, for folks who know, I mean, Coquitlam is out of the re our region is is the largest, uh, you know, sort of city within our region. I mean, you, you tr you're three times Port Moody and three times uh, Port Coquitlam. And, and also you hold a lot of the headquarters for the regional police here as well. So 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 the, in that sense, do you, do you see Coquitlam as the leadership city or or, or is it something that you, you collaborate well with everybody else, or I'm just, just curious how that dynamics works. Yeah, I mean, we collaborate with our neighbors. Coquitlam is the sixth largest city in British Columbia. So, uh, you know, most of the others are in, in the Lower Mainland. I think we're around fourth in the Lower Mainland. Uh, but in this region, we are the, the larger city. Uh, but that's an opportunity for us to uh, to, to work with uh, with partners. Certainly, we uh, we partner with Port Coquitlam on, on uh, police. Uh, we have some uh, sharing arrangements in our recreation facilities. Uh, of course, we're one common school district. So we have a lot of commonality. I think that where some of the areas are that we will continue to work towards uh, working together is things around economic economic development uh, because we know that when we create jobs in our community it's good for the whole region so we'll be looking at doing more uh, stuff along job creation um, and and again just looking for where we have some of some efficiencies of scale as well so so for folks the last four years what kind of highlights do you, do you want to pass on for so I think that uh, certainly uh, we have uh, brought forward a couple of master plans. I think probably our, our biggest uh, plan was the city centre, where we've laid the, uh, the, f the groundwork for what's going to happen in, in the city centre area, which would be the, the Morgard property, uh, Coquitlam Centre, uh, property across the street where Coquitlam Chrysler was. That's uh, under development. So uh, there's going to be a lot of development in the city centre area, and so we're now just uh, laying the groundwork for that as to deciding what, what are the transportation networks going to look like in those areas, what are the densities going to look like? Uh, where are we going to create amenities for people? Uh, how does our, our city centre park, town centre park, how does that uh, fit into the mix? Uh, there's plans for more parks in the, on, you know, right where Coquitlam Centre Mall is right now. There'll be park, there'll be schools in there. Uh, I'm really hoping that we'll have an entertainment district. I'd like to see a, a, a strip of stores, restaurants, uh, brew pubs, uh, you know, where we, where we can actually have an area where people can come out in the evening for enjoy a drink, be on a patio. Uh, I'm hoping that at some point we will uh, build a new uh, performing arts center in there. Maybe that could anchor the sort of the the whole entertainment district. Uh, we're also expecting we're going to have a hotel in in the area now, uh, a small conference center. So this this area is really really coming alive. At the same time, uh, Burke Mountain development is well underway. We're uh, just planning a, a village center up there. So there'll be a shops. So there'll be a new recreation center there with a pool, gymnasium. So it's it's going to be a fairly significant. Uh, recreation center up there. And, and I guess a contentious point is Burke Mountain because it, it sits on top of Port Coquitlam. Uh, and I know for a services aspect that, that you know, the, they say water runs downhill and, and I know traffic also goes the least path. So how is that working with Port Coquitlam with the Fremont connector? So I, I think we're, we're getting close on, on that. Uh, both uh, municipalities, both cities recognize that uh, we're going to have to deal with uh, with the traffic. Uh, some of it's coming from Burke Mountain. Some of it is now cutting through from, uh, um, you know, Westwood Plateau and Port Moody comes over the David uh, connector and, and down Coast Meridian, uh, primarily because that's an easier route than coming along Low Heads. And uh, Port Coquitlam, I think, has done a great job with their uh, uh, retail development in the Dominion Triangle. You know, we've got a Walmart there, a Costco, a Home Depot. Uh, you know, that's attracting a lot breweries. of shoppers and breweries <laughs> and everything's coming there, right? So uh, they're attracting our residents. They're attracting residents from, from afar as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, the traffic goes through all of our neighborhoods and, uh, you know, we have to make sure that, uh, that the traffic flows to its destination and try, we have to try to minimize the impact on, on local neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so working with Port Coquitlam, we have to try to sort of impact some of the traffic that they're feeling. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we recognize that as the lower mainland continues to grow, uh, there's going to be more traffic. Uh, there's 40,000 people moving to the lower mainland every year. That's like adding another Port Moody into the lower mainland every yep. year. So we all have to work together to absorb that uh, um, new 
uh, you know, density that's coming. And at the same time, we have to make sure that uh, the traffic flows, or even better, that we've got uh, you know, rapid transit and, and better uh, bus service so that not everybody who moves here is going to add a, a car to the road. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. I mean, little known fact for most people is, you know, Coquitlam, well, Port Coquitlam and Coquitlam were almost had the same air at one point until they, until we kind of, I guess, broke off into our own little fiefdoms. Yeah, well, Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam were it was one city. Yeah. You know, if you go back into the early 1900s, it was it was one one city, and uh, and uh, you know we've got a very unusual border. Uh, you would have thought naturally it would just follow the Coquitlam River. It doesn't. Yeah. It was actually laid out based on where the farms were. So you have this sort of jig-jag border, and sometimes it's hard for residents to know which side of the border they're on, and it's certainly hard for uh, for people who are visiting to the community. But I think that speaks to the fact that uh, we have a lot of commonality, and, and I think that the residents in Port Coquitlam and the residents of Coquitlam appreciate the same things. We like our natural surroundings. We uh, you know we like the trails here. I, there's some wonderful trails in Port. Coquitlam, there's some wonderful trails up on Burke Mountain. So I think that people move here because they want to be close to nature and at the same time uh, more people are moving here because they want to be close to nature. So it's, uh, it's, it's a catch-22. Yeah, so, so just uh, I guess for if you come into this region for the first time or you've lived here for a while, so uh, the border yeah. thing is always, you know, once you know that you go, oh duh. Uh, yeah. But it is, it is confusing. It's almost like they should have, you know, separated by natural borders. But that's a that's a kind of a colonial trait, you know, just kind yeah. of make straight lines. But but when you look at Coquitlam and you look at Port Coquitlam, it seems to be like there's a different kind of development strategy. Where where in in Coquitlam, and we'll focus on that. You get the Mallardville region, which seems to have some uh, improved uh, tower development. You've got Coquitlam Center, which is now um, uh, hopefully not turning into a Burnett uh, kind of thing, but that's possibly going to happen. And you've got Port Coquitlam, who's uh, and the top of Coquitlam is spreading out over Burke Mountain. So just trying to sense the, the vision or the reasoning behind that sort of what could be seen as confusion or two models at work. Well, there's several models at work. If you look at uh, the Burquitlam area, uh, that is developing for infill. We're seeing older homes coming down. We're seeing uh, three or four homes being bought up and a, a, a land assembly taking place. We're seeing strip malls coming down. We're seeing housing going in areas that used to be a parking lot of a strip mall, very much like what happened in Metro Town in the early 80s. Then you go down the Fraser Mills, we're going to see a riverside community, They're very much like a Westminster Key development's going to happen there. Uh, you get up into Burke Mountain, that's a brand new development, Greenfield. So you're going to see single family homes and, and townhouses up there with brand new, everything is new, the roads and everything. And then you go down into uh, city centre and uh, you're going to see very much like what you see currently taking place in, uh, in Surrey and Wally where you're seeing the, that density happening. It's really been driven by the arrival of Skytrain. So with Skytrain coming through uh, Burquitlam and uh, finish in, in, you know, the destination in city centre, that's why you're going to see the higher density and more of the downtown type living there. But I think in time we will see the SkyTrain eventually extend through Port Coquitlam, possibly you know into Maple Ridge, and when that happens, Port Coquitlam will go through a, a similar uh, development where they will start to see the density along the rail line. And, and it's interesting because when you go through and uh, look through history, uh, even through the great cities in Europe, all the, the, big, the great cities all developed along rivers because that's where the transport network was in the early 1700s in the United States where the rail where the railways intersected places like Chicago and places like that that's where the cities grew so we have always through through history uh, developed and and built near transportation routes whether it be along rivers or along rail and, and that's what we're seeing today we're going to see more density along the Broadway connector in Vancouver we're going to see some of that density now in Surrey as they head out to Langley and and I think that's natural so we'll see uh, higher density density near SkyTrain, near the transit, then we'll see the density sort of drop off as you get further away, and then uh, there'll be places in Coquitlam that will remain relatively unchanged. So, so one of the, 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 there's a few big campaign issues or big challenges. One, of course, is affordability. Mm -hmm. So for yourself, um, affordability and market value or market rentals or all these kind of things, what does that mean to you? Uh, as a counselor when you're looking at that? Yeah, so, you know, years ago when we started talking about affordable housing and that was really, and that context was about, you know, for people who are marginalized or, or people that were homeless. And, and now we talk about um, housing affordability 
which is house affordable for everybody. Uh, you know, we, we have a shortage of housing for, for workers, uh, young people starting out, seniors wanting to downsize. So we have to provide a whole range of housing and we have to make sure that it's affordable for everybody. Um, obviously, everybody has different levels of income uh, and those with a higher income, they may want something larger or something different than somebody who's just starting out. But we have to make sure that we have rental and we have to have home ownership options as well. But I've often talked about not just housing affordability, but what I call affordable living. And in order to be afford to live in Coquitlam, we've got to make sure that uh, certainly housing is a big part of it, but after housing comes transportation. That's your next biggest cost. So by being able to provide uh, transit options, transit passes, buses, that helps to keep the cost of transit down. Following that is uh, daycare and so uh, or child care. And so now we're seeing the city getting involved in uh, uh, and trying to work with developers to make sure that there's child care spaces uh, being built in the city. Certainly the provincial and federal government working on the $10 a day uh, child care plan, but you've got to have spots for it. And then so, so I think it's really working with all of those three, housing, transportation and child care, so that we can make it so that it's affordable for families to move to Coquitlam and to continue to live in Coquitlam. But don't you see that, that I mean, for me, you, know, you, have, you have older boys, yep. probably the same age yep. as mine. I mean, uh, they're living in my house. <laughs> but um, um, but it, it seems like the mean average is 75000 a year. Mm -hmm. You've got apartments that are 500000 plus. Rentals at, at you know some some people think rentals are twelve hundred. There are eighteen fifty yep. to twenty five, twenty six hundred. Thirty percent of of your income should be to be a healthy, oh, you know, living human. Yep. The math doesn't. It seems to me like the for the young people, we're we're we're, we're kind of we're saying the we're saying yep. the right things, but we're you know, the execution seems to be concerning. Yeah, and and it's a real challenge because you have to build enough inventory. For, for you know the pricing to come down and at the same time land prices are very high in Coquitlam and they're high in the lower mainland because we can't make it there's we're, there's a shortage of land and so that's that's what drives pricing so we have to be creative on on the housing certainly creating housing uh, density helps because you know somebody says well you don't make any more land well that's true but we do in the sky so if you have you know half an acre of land you can build you know six homes or you can build a high-rise that duplicates that you know that floor plate several times over so it is going to be density is the only way that we're going to be able to create land and uh, and you know they're you know my kids are not going to live in a in a uh, in a in a home like I had or even a home like they grew up they are going to pr live in something that's smaller probably a townhouse I think that's more where our most affordable housing is going to be in townhouses and and when we do that and we have more people living in townhouses with smaller yards, that's when it becomes tricky for the city because then we have to provide the amenities. And so now you provide shared amenities. So instead of everybody having a backyard with an above ground swimming pool and a swing set and a tree fort, you've now got to look and sort of say, okay, well, how do we share that land? And that means swimming pools, uh, you know, uh, gymnasiums, uh, parks, uh, table tennis and parks, uh, basketball courts. So the things that we maybe had in our driveway or uh, in our backyard now have to be built within the community so that we can uh, and make as best use as we can out of our land. And we still want to make sure that our city is livable at, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It's one thing to be able to say I can afford to live here, but it's got to be enjoyable to live here as well. Yeah, so, so I, I think... Uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about that, and, and hopefully after this election, we we get a lot more you know community involvement in in sort of affordability. I think we we need to come together at least in some consensus there. But the one that's really big is when people look at Coquitlam and we see this building is the developer. You know, if you're a developer, you know the city is a is a fertile ground to run business. And then the the sec second challenge is campaign financing. And I know you well, you were part of the group that sort of helped a new new want to be candidates and explain to them kind of what it was like to become, you know, run for council. And I think the number that you sort of put out was like 15 to 30,000 is kind of within that range, right? And we know there's a large mailer that has to go out. It might cost you 10 grand to be part of that. So what's your, what's your, what's your concern or, or, or things that make you cautious about developers and campaign financing and all those things that kind of dance in people's minds when it comes yeah. to elections. Yeah, and provincial government changed the rules uh, last election before the 2014 election. I thought it was some, some very good changes there. Uh, they've taken out corporate donations now. They've put limits on personal donations so that if you you know, if you've got a lot of money or just recently retired or your great aunt left you some money, that 
that doesn't give you an advantage over other candidates. So every candidate's limited to the same amount of money that they can put in. Uh, there's limits on amount on spending based on the size of a municipality, and uh, and donations are, are capped at twelve twelve fifty each uh, per year. So I, I think that they've the provincial government brought in some good things to try to level the playing field. Um, I think that uh, you know there there is it is expensive to run a campaign in Coquitlam uh, because we're a community of a hundred and fifty thousand people. And we're the largest uh, city in British Columbia that uh, does not have slates. So uh, we're all independent candidates. So that sometimes makes it tougher because you're not pooling resources, you're not sharing uh, campaign teams. So it is, it is a pretty daunting task to go, to go out there and mount a campaign. And I often tell people, you know, running a, a civic campaign in Coquitlam is like running three provincial campaigns because we, we, we're three provincial ridings, but when it comes to a civic election, we're one, one big riding. And so, uh, you know, some of the, we've done some things to try to make it easier. Uh, the uh, the mail out pro uh, mail out pr program is really good. It allows candidates to to share the cost of mailing. The city runs it at cost, and the more people that go into it, the the less it, less it costs. But you know, you still have to print sixty thousand brochures, and you still have to contribute to the mail out. So so for most people, you're looking at about eight thousand dollars to to get into it before you buy some election advertising and maybe some signs. So so I tell people. People, you know, be prepared to raise about ten thousand dollars. Yeah. So, so, and I appreciate again. I appreciate the fact that you were candid about that when you you did the community outreach. So, whether mm -hmm. it's you know, it's it's interesting. But the last, the last one I would say is that you know, when you talk about this, we don't run slates here, right? Yep. Of course. But but in some ways, uh, we do sort of endorse the candidates. I mean, you're you're a candidate that last election was number one out of the all, all councillors. Mm. So obviously a popularity, you're doing, you know, doing all the right things. But in general, there is this kind of a, a, a subtle endorsement, right? It's almost like if you're a mayor, you want to have your team that you can work with. So is that sort of a practice that we see in the, in the cities? No, but I think that uh, one of the things that I think that certainly that I like about Coquitlam is that it has a really good council that works together. And, and I serve on the Union of BC Municipalities, so I, I see the makeup of councils right across British Columbia. And, and I've seen councils where people run as a team uh, on a slate, mm. and once they're elected, they don't get along as well as the the, uh, the councillors like in Vancouver. Coquitlam do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, it breaks apart. So I think that if you've got good people that have a good working relationship, that are people that are easy to work with, that have a, a sort of all want the same things, then I think it's easier to work together as as a group. Do, they're not always going to agree on things, but it, in fact, I I like it when we don't always agree because we have a good discussion that gets me thinking about something, and then at the end of the day, you know, most of our votes are almost unanimous because we try to work things out so to say hey if I change this you know let's tweak this how can we get to a point that we all think that this is a good direction to go in and I think that by working towards consensus then that means that you've got a council that's functioning well and I think the Coquitlam Council functions well and people have asked me well you know it's gonna be two at least two new spots on council who do you support and I'm saying I'm hoping for somebody that's easy to work with they don't have to agree with me they don't have to come from the same political spectrum spot as I do I just want some people that really have some great ideas and want to be part of a good team and work together for the residents of Coquitlam. So, so the last big one is this, this is, is sort of resilient communities or sustainable mm -hmm. communities and we, we've seen the floods and the fires so yep. I think last election that was a topic and I must admit I was like what are they talking about but after you know I've gone through a few floods and fires myself I kind of get what they're saying yep. uh, and now we're even talking about you know the the play of the province and the, and the feds and ultimately when a disaster like Abbotsford happens everybody's putting cash into the pot. So what's your kind of, uh, you know, give a sense for folks what what concerns you about that or what things are we need to be focused on uh, for your for your yeah. residents of Coquitlam? Yeah, so I, I chair the uh, Union of BC's Community Safety Committee. Uh, one of the events that we had at UBCM is we brought the Mayor of Abbotsford in, the Mayor of uh, Merritt, the Mayor of Princeton. We had them come in and talk. But what was it like to be in the community and, and your community when, you, in some cases, Abbotsford, they were isolated. You know, Abbotsford became a, almost an island and a lot of it was a lot of it was underwater. So the one thing that came across for the whole thing and talking to the mayors was is that they showed great leadership. The, all of those mayors had the ability to rise to, you know, to a, a 
spot of greatness during a during a, a, a major disaster. We were lucky that nobody was killed. We lost a lot of livestock. We had uh, transportation routes cut off. But the one thing that came through was that we had good leadership at the local level. Now we have a problem with how we're going to pay to fix everything. Uh, years ago, the provincial government decided to make municipalities responsible for dikes and, and for dams. Well, there's not enough money in a municipal budget to, to pay for that. We're talking billions of dollars in, in Abbotsford. You know, you, you couldn't even raise enough through taxation over the next 20, 30 years to pay for that. And so what happened was is that municipalities that were faced with the fix the potholes, fix this, they didn't put money into the dams and things because they just didn't have the money to put it into dikes. And so what's going to have to happen is the federal government's going to have to come in and put money in. I mean, for every dollar you spend, if you don't spend it, it's going to be like six to eight dollars later in remediation and cleanup afterwards. So we've all recognized that we have to work together. Building a dam or a dike around one city and not continuing it down the river doesn't help because it's like building a boat with only three sides or something. You've got to have a complete system. And so the work that I'm doing with Metro and with the provincial government is to look at ways that we can evaluate all the diking system for the lower mainland, look at where the weakest spots are, work on them first, and then try to build resiliency up. And, and it's not just about protecting us from water that's coming over the, over the dikes. It's about water that's coming out of the sky. It's about extreme weather events. It's about making sure that our infrastructure is, is solid. Uh, in Abbotsford, they came within half a day of losing their major pump station. It was because a bunch of volunteers came in and started sandbagging a pump station. If that had failed, they would have had a whole worse situation. So we know our infrastructure needs to be improved, and, and that work starts now. Yes, it's, I mean, for me, you know, uh, you learn through these disasters. I mean, now I understand what the Ford means in Abbotsford. You know, it's <laughs> sort of like, and someone told me it was a lake, I go, what? I mean, yeah. so it just shows you how you kind of uh, dis get disconnected from uh, from the community. So yeah. b before we wrap up, is there anything you just want to sort of uh, pass on to the constituents uh, as you run for this election? No, I, I think the main thing is to uh, to talk to the candidates. As I said, there's going to be at least two new spots on, on council. So uh, take the time to learn about all of the candidates, uh, see which candidates have the same values that you do. Uh, and, and look, it's, it's like you're building a team. You know, you, you can have the best goal in the world, but if your forwards aren't on the same page, then it's not going to be a great team. So I think what, we're, what we really need to do is look at building a great group of people that uh, can move the city forward and, and continue to provide the services in this community that I think our, our residents really appreciate. And remember it, uh, October 15th is voting day. Appreciate that. So thanks for coming in. That's uh, Councillor Hodge. Uh, he was the uh, one of the top six uh, councillors who ran in the last election. As, he, as he's pointed out many times, the, uh, the voting rate is about 20x percent in, in Coquitlam, so we need to get more folks out voting. But if you have any questions about Councillor Hodge and his platform, please reach out to his website. And again, thanks for watching. It's Patrick McCarthy from Tri-Cities Community Television. Thank you very much, Councillor. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.